Hi, this is Jimmy. I want to say how humbled I am that you take time to be a part of our teaching ministry each week. Like that is huge for us, extremely exciting for me as a as a teacher of the word. But I also want to encourage you that if you're close by, you're local, near Overland Park or in Overland Park, come and be a part of our community. And if you're not, if you're far away, like you can use this video as a tool, but nothing can replace the fellowship and connection with a body of believers. So I'd encourage you that while you take advantage of these videos and, and they help you in your journey with the Lord, please know nothing can replace that connection and the value of the body of Christ. So find you a church that teaches the Bible and has some people in it that you can do life with. Hope you enjoy the word today and I hope it brings life to you. Welcome to Overland Park Community Church. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn to Hebrews chapter 5. You can use the Version app as well and do a search for Overland Park Community Church and you'll find um, the message there as well. You can follow along on that app if you prefer. And uh, do appreciate, just want to give a little bit of a shout out to those of you who started the movement on social media last night. Um, someone had requested that, that I bring back the beard, okay? <laughs> last, year, last year was the first time I ever grew a beard. And so I wanted to say um, the beard is going to be like Jesus is coming back. <laughs> but I'm having a little trouble out of Abby this year. So she's not up here today. So I need you guys to help me out here. And when you see her, just be like, man, you think Jimmy will grow that beard back this year? And maybe she'll let me do that. Uh, it was kind of a fun experience for me because I didn't have to shave every day. And I thought that was awesome. Uh, so anyway, um, good to see you all. You didn't come to listen to me talk about my beard, but somebody else started it. And uh, my ADD won't allow me to not address things like that. And so anyway, uh, we look at things and, and, and maybe even we would look at that and say, well, Abby might say, well, the, the, the beard is, is good, but I like you better without it. Okay. Isn't it funny how we look at things like that and we often will make observations. We Abby likes to make, um, well, she used to like to make pies, and now all the kids have come, and she doesn't like to make them, but she's really good at making pies. And, and thankfully, she's taught uh, Faith and, and Jonah have picked it up, and they're getting pretty good at, at making these pies. And so they might make uh, a cherry pie, and they might make a uh, blueberry pie. Now, I'm going to just key you in on a secret from someone I learned here, some, from something I learned from someone here at the church Clara Cohe has been a member of the church for a long time, and, and she, uh, we, we had a potluck meal one time, and she, there was some of her cherry pie left. She said, take that home and eat it. And so I ate that cherry pie, and I thought, man, that is, that is one of the best cherry pies I've ever had. And so I asked her, I said, you know, the, the cherry pie wasn't tart at all. And I said, usually ours are a little bit tart. And I said, what, what did you do? She said, oh, I just put, put a little bit of almond flavoring in it. And man, we started doing that, and cherry pie will just bow at our house go, bam, it's just gone. So put a little almond flavoring in it, and it might be good without it, but it's better with it. We might look at uh, uh, an outfit, and we say, well, that, that, that one looks good, but oh, this one's, this one's much better. Um, and so we, we do this all the time, as we're always making these decisions, go over there, but it's good, and we don't want to settle for good. We always want what is better. And so the, the writer of Hebrews, at this point in time, he has taken us on a journey. We're nearing the halfway point as we started with the series in ra uh, Radiance, or being a radiant church and, and radiating the glory of God. And now we're moving into an indestructible life, and he's teaching us how do we build lives that are indestructible. We already have an indestructible life if we know Christ. Um, his power, and we'll see here in the coming weeks, it comes from his high priestliness is based upon not um, any a system by man, but, but based on his indestructible life. And so he gives us that indestructible life. And so eternally, we are um, expected, like we know that the scripture teaches us, we will live forever. And, and we're indestructible in, in that kind of life then and there. But we're supposed to be living it out here and now. 
And that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus as you're trying to bring what's already in heaven down to earth. And, and, and when we think in terms of what our objective is, I like what Brent talked about inviting people and them being a part of the family. We, we take the then and there and bring it to the here and now. And that prayer that Jesus taught us in the model prayer, your, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we take the then and there, that indestructible life, we bring it to the here and now and we serve as, as conduits for people to connect with Christ. They come to know Christ through relationship with other people who've been transformed by the power of Christ themselves. And so, so the writer, as we near this halfway point, we begin to focus on the high priestly or high priesthood of Christ himself as he fulfills all offices that we see in the, the Bible, the office of prophet, the office of priest, and the office of king, the writer begins to focus on that. Well, the, up to this point, he's taking us on the, this journey, and that is that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. And so we are to radiate that. But not only is Jesus the radiance of God's glory, we learned that he rules with a scepter of righteousness. And so his, his scepter, which that scepter is designed to kind of symbolize a rule and authority and the scepter that the writer of Hebrews uses to describe Jesus in his um, kingly nature and his high priesthood is a scepter of righteousness which he di uh, dispenses into our lives and he imparts his holiness on us. And we learned that. He, he, he takes his holiness and he puts it in us when we take him by the hand and he leads us as the trailblazer, blazer, the, the pioneer who blazed a trail back to God. He leads us in that capacity so that we can function from a place of rest. Remember how we learned how the, the, on the Sabbath, he talked about the Sabbath so much, and it wasn't so much about a day of worship as it was a lifestyle that we begin to work from rest, not rest from work, because we're not slaves anymore. We're not mastered by the system of the fall. We're mastered by the fall and the curse being lifted off of us, and so now we're functioning from a place of rest, and so he then moves into, because we function from that place of rest, Jesus shows us what it means to be a complete person. And so he's a model of completeness, and we are to be complete people. So now today, he says in verse 1 of chapter 6, therefore, and he's taking us, like it's like he's taking all of this stuff, and he's saying, therefore, let us he says, move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instruction about cleansing rites, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And God permitting, we will do so. So last week we looked at, in order to be a complete person, we have to, we have to graduate spiritual preschool. We have, to, we have to, today's first takeaway, it's better to move beyond than it is to stay in the same place. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is teaching us. He says, look, look at all of this stuff I've taught you up to this point. The writer tells us, he says, it's better for you to move beyond all of the immature stuff and be a mature, complete person in Christ. And so he says, therefore, I'm not leaving you in spiritual preschool. Now, that's my heart as a pastor, as someone who's, um, you know, charged with the responsibility of leading Overland Park Community Church. Our mission is to fully develop people in Christ. I don't want to leave you in preschool. And so I'm going to constantly be preaching and teaching the whole counsel of the Word of God, even to a point that I hope that it moves you in some place in your life uh, uh, to, of discomfort on a weekly basis just so that you will find movement toward mat maturity. I don't want to leave you behind. I want to do everything that I can as a pastor to help you move beyond the elementary things in life, the elementary spiritual things of our faith. And, and really, to be honest with you, um, 
too many preschoolers in, in, in the world, too many preschoolers in, in America. Like the greatest country, all the resources, all of the, uh, you know, the wealth that we could um, imagine having, having as a country. If you've ever visited a third world country, you quickly learn that one of the things that we have is abundant resources, even the soil from which we plant our, our plants and our crops in is, is so resourceful. And so we are blessed, but with all of that blessing, we've become so spiritually immature. Like, just so spiritually immature. It, 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 and, and it plays itself out in our society. Like, look at the, look at the, the, the election right now. Like, we look at that and go, oh, man, like, what's wrong? I'll tell you what's wrong. We're spiritually immature. And, and I mean, like, as a country. And so you end up getting the kind of discussions that we're having today. They're meaningless. Like, just like not really productive, not, not real substance from either, either candidate. And it's, it's discouraging as we go, what, what's wrong? We're in spiritual preschool. And so we've raised a bunch of infants, and nobody, uh, infants are raising infants. It's kind of like what the same scenario that Jesus taught over and over. It's like it's the blind leading the blind. Yet in this sense, when we look at it, we go, okay, well, there are people who are part of the kingdom, but they're not growing in Christ. And so the writer says, listen, Therefore, let us leave the elementary things. Let us move beyond all of that stuff. And that's the, the challenge that he's issuing for us. And so what are we leaving? What is it that, that we're, we're leaving behind? Well, he shows us one of the things is we're leaving behind the dead works of legalism. We're leaving that behind. He says here, not uh, he says uh, leaving the... Uh, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death. And so he's talking about being dependent upon something that you engage in in a religious manner that will only lead to death and not new life that Jesus came to make a reality for the people of God. So that's what he's saying to these Jewish Christians. We gotta move beyond that stuff. We gotta move beyond dead legalism. Well, what do you mean? You got to move beyond just church attendance. You got to move beyond just giving. You got to move beyond the legalistic things that think that make one believe that they're right with God. You got to move beyond performance and begin to understand your position. Remember we talked about how Jesus changes our position. And no longer are we trying to perform in order to please God. He just moves us into a position of pleasure with God. Therefore, because we are in that position, we have to move from uh, beyond the elementary things in our spiritual DNA and move beyond that stuff. Move beyond legalism. And he says to us, not only should we move beyond legalism, we should move beyond like things like baptism and salvation. Now, for these people, um, a lot of what he was addressing was like ceremonial washings that they had been accustomed to learning about all of their lives. They move beyond that stuff. Move beyond the sacrifices of the lambs. And, and don't be caught up in the temple worship. But, but what he's saying to us is move. I think the application that is timeless is move beyond baptism. Move beyond salvation. Well, am I saying that, that we don't make those things important? Of course not. Like, they, they are extremely important in order for one to become an infant in Christ. Like, Jesus said, you must be born again. And so, it is extremely important to um, understand to come into the kingdom of God. A birth has to take place spiritually. It's in, extremely important that one of my first steps of obedience is baptism. Like following Jesus after I've received Christ, following him in the baptismal waters as a symbol of what has happened to me in the faith. Now, some of you are stuck in preschool because 
frankly, you probably need to get baptized. And, and you don't want to. And, you're, and, the, and the enemy, the devil himself that we've learned about in this, this, te- this book, he roams around like a prince of the air. He's convinced you that's for kids. And so you don't do it because it's for kids. You're acting like a kid by being disobedient, rebellious to the truth of God's word. Move beyond baptism. Don't let baptism be the thing that hangs you up. If you've never been baptized in a proper biblical baptism, then then make the decision to get baptized and move beyond it. Don't act like a baby anymore. I don't care if you're, you're, you're 10 or you're, you're, you're 50. Move beyond the elementary things so that you can mature in Christ. Remember, he's trying to teach us about the priesthood of, of Christ, how he is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. And, and he's getting ready to teach them that in chapter 7. But before he does, he says, I can't talk to you about the, the deep things of God because you're stuck in preschool. Move beyond baptism. Move beyond salvation. Move beyond your conversion experience. Move beyond laying on of hands. What does that mean? Well, they, uh, we will, If we ordain someone in ministry, we will lay on hands. We will lay our hands on them. That's what it means from a, a New Testament perspective uh, in the church is like when I was ordained into ministry there were a group of ordained men who laid their hands on me they set me aside for ministry they recognized that God was moving in me and that that I had been following the Lord and enough time had passed that they laid hands on me and they prayed that God's power would be on me to um, lead in ministry and, and advance the kingdom of God and so that's one aspect of laying on of hands he says, move beyond that. Move beyond um, how ministry happens. But th- then there's another laying on of the hands. He says, we sometimes lay their hands on the sacrifice before it was made. And, and then they would sacrifice the animal. It's just move beyond that. Like move beyond the elementary stuff. Um, move, move beyond the resurrection. What? Yeah. Move beyond it. Move, move beyond the, the getting caught up. Like a lot of times people get caught up in um, what happens in the resurrection. Well, what happens is we rise from the dead, and, and that's exciting. And I'm looking forward to that. Like I, I am looking forward to, to knowing the truth of the Bible that it teaches me that when I die, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so my body is laid to rest in the ground and my soul goes on to be with the Lord. But in the future, the resurrection teaches that my body will come back up out of the ground. God will give me a glorified body like Jesus who was the first fruits of the resurrection. And, and, and my body and my soul will be re- reunited. But the writer of Hebrews is saying, move beyond that, man. Move beyond just thinking about the future. Move beyond just thinking about heaven. Live in the here and now. Like these things are just elementary things of our faith. The resurrection is just an elementary thing, very deep and necessary thing. I'm not discounting it, okay? What I'm saying is if we stop right there and we say, well, I understand the resurrection, I understand conversion, I understand baptism, I understand laying on of hands, I understand I'm not to be a legalist, that I'm covered by the grace of God, then I'm good. No, 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 not according to Hebrews. Move beyond that. Like you wanna wanna be a person who is complete in Christ, you have to move beyond all of those things. Don't just think that that's it. This thing never quits. Listen, I I have been a, a teacher of the Bible for two decades, and, and I'm still learning. I'm still learning things from the Word of God that that are blowing my mind. I'm still learning things about myself and my weaknesses. I'm not still learning about what it means to be saved, what it means to be baptized, what it means like, like the elementary things. I'm deepening in my faith through walking with the Lord and stepping out in obedience to whatever he calls me to. Me to. I'm, I'm moving beyond that, and it's better to do those things. This is what the, the writer is telling us. Move beyond eternal judgment. All of these things he's talking to us about. Um, and so what he's saying is don't just learn the language and live it out. Yeah, somebody, what it means to lead someone to, to, to Christ, and a lot of times 
the, the answer from the follower of Christ, the, the person who's been around the church, is that you have to lead them through the ABCs of the faith. They have to acknowledge in their heart that they're sinners. They have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as the be, and they have to confess with their mouth. That's true. Like, all of that is true, but that's just language. Like, are we doing it? Are we leading people to the throne of God where they're meeting Christ? Have we moved beyond the elementary things and we know more than just the language? We've actually become uh, students of Christ, disciples who are being mentored by the Holy Spirit and we've moved beyond the elementary and now we're being deepened and, and the writer is saying it's better. It's better to move beyond. And I love what he says in verse three, and God permitting, we will do so. Right. In other words, if God is in it, you can do it. So like you, you, you're like, listen to me teach, and then you listen to me talk about, well, yeah, that's for you. You've been teaching the Bible um, for, for 20 years, and that's why you got such a good grasp of it. No, I got such a good grasp of it because I've been in it for 20 years. I've been listening to what the Word is saying to me. I've been listening to the voice of God. I've been repenting when I've show, been shown the error of my ways. I've moved beyond the elementary. I'm practicing and moved into spiritual maturity. And you can do it, God permitting, and He is permitting. <laughs> it is God's will for every one of you to grow in Christ to flourish, not to stay where you're at, not just to just settle for going to church on Sunday morning. Get in the word of God. Fall in love with it. Let it transform your life. When's the last time you opened up the scripture and dug out a, 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 a nugget of truth that just blew your mind and you're like, oh, I, can't, I gotta tell somebody this. You wanna know why it's so hard to talk to your friends about um, the Lord and church? It's because you're not learning anything. If you learn something new, you can't help but get excited about it. What happens when you get a new recipe? Why am I talking about food so much today? You get a new recipe, this is good, or you gotta try this out, I gotta make this for somebody, and you eat it all, you gotta make another one of those, and you gotta tell everybody, you put it on social media, why? Because you learned something. You were stretched, and that's what happens when you get in the Word, man. Boom, it impacts you. You're like, I got to tell somebody. I, like, you want to know where the passion comes from for me on a Sunday morning? Every week, it's just being in the Word, man, and, and it just, like, it gets in me, and it's got to get out, and sometimes I, I have to go upstairs after putting something together, and I just have to pull Abby aside and say, you, know, you got to hear this, and she's like, And she'll stop and listen. And it's because something is in me and it's trying to get out. And so that's what happens is the writer's saying it's better to move beyond and, and, and move beyond the elementary things because the elementary things can get you hung up. Isn't that crazy to think about? But, and again, we're not saying that none of this is important. It's all like extremely important to our faith. It's how we come to know Jesus but the writer of Hebrews is not just calling us to come and know, he's calling us to come and grow. And so if we're going to move beyond conversion to growth, we have to go and grow. And, and, and I, I don't want to leave you there. I'm not going to leave you there. You can come back next week. I'm going to have another word from you. You can bring a friend next week. And, and here's what I've tried to do in, in, in my ministry throughout uh, my time in ministry is just remove any obstacle that would embarrass you from inviting your friends. Like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do anything to embarrass you. I'm going to make, we're going to make sure we work hard and Brent and the team works hard to make sure the worship is on so that you don't have to feel embarrassed. Okay. We do everything that we can to create a service that, that takes away any obstacle that would keep you from inviting your friends. Why? So they can come and grow with us. And so next week, we're going to be ready. We're going to be offering up an incredible worship to the God of the universe. And, and we're going to have worked hard to have the word available to help people come and grow. And so I encourage you to get in the word, get excited so that you can invite somebody to come and grow with you. And it's just a natural, organic experience that flows out of you. And so he says it's better to move beyond. Then he goes into one of these most difficult passages um, in, in Scripture. 
And he says in verse 4, it is impossible for those who have once been enlightened. I hear myself talking somewhere. (laughs) I'm pretty sure that just said, hi, this is Jimmy. (laughs) Uh, It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have that's, that's from the website. I know that, so that's a good thing. It's impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have um, tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. To their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting Him to public disgrace. Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed, receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. Here's the second takeaway. It's better to be a blessing. It's better to be a blessing. Verse 7 teaches us that when we are a blessing, we are blessed. Okay? And so when we are a blessing to others, we are a blessed. So bountiful harvest in our lives equals bountiful blessing from God. So when God is looking at my life and there is a harvest coming in for the kingdom, I can expect a bountiful blessing to come my way. So you might ask, well, Jimmy, are you saying that God blesses us as we serve him? That's exactly what I'm saying. I'm 100% confident and comfortable in saying that. Why? Because God chooses to use weak people like myself we people like us, as conduits by which he will grow his kingdom. And so as I'm living out the truths of the word of God in my life, and I'm blessing others with the blessings that God has imparted in my life, then God wants to pour more blessing out in my life. Why? So that I can bless more people. Like, I'm, I, I'm convinced that there are people in my life who do not know God who are blessed because they know me. Now, I do not mean that in an egotistical sense. I mean it like this. My children are blessed to be growing up in the home that they're growing in because they are getting inundated with truth. And so that is a blessing of being a part of Abby and I's life as as we're sold out to the kingdom. A a, a child who grows up in a home where maybe people have mediocre faith and they're not sold out and they're just kind of, they feel like they should go to church. There's not as much blessing for that child to learn about God as would happen in in a committed Christian family's home. And so they're blessed. But then beyond that, there are people that experience residual blessing because I'm always looking at how can I minister to people around me. So don't just look at my life as existing for myself. I'm, I'm looking at my life and going, I belong to Christ. I want to radiate his glory. And the only way that I can do that is by being a blessing to other people. And so the writer tells us it's better to be a blessing because when you are a blessing, you will be blessed even in greater capacity because God can use you. Verse 8, he says, when we are a curse, we are cursed. This fascinating teaching, verse 7 and 8, land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed, receives the blessing of God. Verse 8, but land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. When we are a curse, we are cursed. If you produce nothing but weeds in your life, you face nothing but fire. Well, that's strong, it's challenging. But thus saith the word of God. Now, 
The writer goes on to say this in the beginning. It is impossible for those who have been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. Now I look at that verse and say, well, does that mean I can lose my salvation? I can just tell you as I read it and I understand the scripture, it seems that it does teach that. Now, I'm kind of an odd bird. <laughs> no amens there. <laughs> I'm kind of an odd bird in this because I grew up in a home that was, we, we were taught all of our lives a Calvinistic version of theology. Or to explain that, believing that in eternal security. There's nothing you could do to lose your salvation. And so I was taught that all my life up, up until about the age of 16. And then at 16, I started to go to, uh, my mom started to go to a different church. I didn't get involved in it until later in life. And it was more of an Arminian view. And that was a view in which you was taught that you could lose your salvation. And so as I look at the doctrine of apostasy and eternal security, here's what I would say to you. I see them both. Like, I see them both in Scripture. Now, growing up, this is what's odd, I think, about me. Growing up in a, in a home that was taught there was nothing I could ever do to lose my salvation, I remember from like 16 to 22 praying every night, um, Lord, because I was not living for the Lord, Lord, even though I was taught all my life, nothing you could do to lose your salvation. Lord, if I die tonight, please don't let me go to hell. Well, that doesn't sound very secure, does it? And so now on the other side of it, I believe in the possibility of apostasy, and I've never prayed that prayer. And so I, could, I don't think I could ever be more eternally secure. Now, just say all that to say, look, I, I, there, are, there are people who are much smarter than me that have been debating this for thousands of years. But this is what I would tell you. I see both of the doctrines in Scripture, and I see it as the sovereignty of God and the free will of man. They are both there. And anybody who says, well, I've got it all figured out, I don't know about that, man. Uh, I just don't know about that. I can tell you, just honestly, transparently, I see them both. I, and I am eternally secure, and I believe it is possible to turn your back on God. I believe if faith can get you in to the kingdom of God, not having faith can get you out. And so we look and we go, okay, wh wh what's going on here? Well, I believe apostasy is possible and the co consequences are catastrophic. Now, what does that mean for us? I think it means casual Christianity has consequences. It just has consequences. And, and, and the New Testament focuses more on growing than it does coming to Christ. So there are consequences. One is not more important than the other. They're both equally important. But once we come to Christ, we're expected to grow. And I think it is very dangerous for us not to be intentional about that spiritual development. And thus the mission of Overland Park Community Church is to fully develop people in Christ. Not just to get people converted. We want them to get converted and then we want them to get developed in Christ so that they become disciples who are following through with their commitment. Why, why are we serious about that? Because we believe it is dangerous to be complacent with your faith. Why do we believe it's dangerous? Because just like the writer of Hebrews has shown us, hard hearts exist and they lead us away from God. And in and, and one moment we could be on fire for the Lord and then we start drifting away and we just act like things don't, we don't care about spiritual things and we can find ourselves five years down the road not even in church anymore living like God doesn't even exist and our hearts become so hard and callous toward God that we don't care anymore and we say well how do you know when that happens you don't only God does and potentially the person who it happens to and that person probably their heart is so hard they don't care anymore 
And so I, I don't go around and making judgments on people on whether it's happened or not. I just see that it is a possibility. So we look at it and I go, whoa, man, hold on, bro. I just want to be encouraged. I don't want that truth right there. Sorry, it's in there. It's like Prego spaghetti sauce. It's in there. I didn't make it up. I'm just reading it. But here's the encouraging part. The writer doesn't share to scare. <laughs> He shares to move us to choose better. Now, as we land this thing, we bring it down. Look at verse 9. Listen, I love what he says. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are convinced of better things in your case. The things that have to do with salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end so that what you hope for may be fully realized. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Here's the third takeaway. God's better character gives rise to our better confidence. <laughs> Verse 10, God notices is what it's teaching us. God's not unjust. He will not forget the work you have and the love you have shown him as you, what, have helped his people and continue to help them. God notices and he will work to make us a blessing to others. But that gives me confidence. Like that makes me want to get in the word. I'm like, man, God, he's not unjust. He notices when I'm trying and putting forth effort. He's not an unjust God. God is not going to do anything unfair. You need not be worried about your salvation. That's what the writer is saying. I, I, even though I speak like this, I'm trying to encourage you and showing you some truth here, but I, no reason to be discouraged because we are believing better things. Verse 11 says, be diligent so that your hope is fully realized. Well, what the heck does that mean? Be diligent in moving beyond the elementary things so that the hope that you have in you is fully realized. And I like basketball. And sometimes we might say a, a, about a person who plays basketball, he's a, Man, that guy is a pure shooter. No one's ever said that about me, okay? I can be on one time and off six times. But some guys can go in the gym, man, and they are just pure shooters because something is in their DNA that just makes them naturally gifted at it. If they never started shooting, they would never know they were pure shooters. And so they had to be diligent so that what was in them could be fully realized. That's what the writer is saying to us. Choose better because what is in you can be fully realized, the hope that is in you, and, and you can experience things in life that will just absolutely blow your mind because God is not unjust. He recognizes when you want to use your life to help people that belong to him, and so he will pour out a bountiful blessing on your life so that you can bless others, and that's what it means to be in the zone as a follower of Jesus. Like the pure shooter just can't miss the Christian who has a pure heart that is following God with all his heart, mind, and soul can't miss. And so the writer tells us that. And then in verse 12, he says, don't be lazy. Rather, imitate people who know how to do this. And so, so he's saying, like, like, find some people around who you, you, you know that are good at this. And, and, and watch their lives and emulate the things that they're doing. Learn how to do what they're doing so that you can experience all that God has for you just like they are. And, and God is saying, I will put people in your life for you to look, around, look up to. That's why he goes on to say, and we'll see later in Hebrews, don't forsake yourself, the, the, the assembling of yourselves together. Why? Because we're the body of Christ. We come around each other. We watch each other. We see each other. We help each other grow. We encourage each other so that our faith blossoms and we become the people of God who do what? Radiate the glory of God. Uh, that as Jesus radiates the glory of God and the scepter of righteousness is imputed upon us and we just radiate and our lives are what? Indestructible. Both then and there and here and now. <laughs> That's what he's trying to get us to do. 
move beyond the elementary. Move beyond just being able to say, well, I know I'm saved. And work and be diligent to know him more. Now, before I give you the big idea, I would just say this. We don't work to get. We work because we got. Like, it's just in that sense that we just work like we want to because of who he is. He is a good father. And so the big idea for you today is choose better things. I choose better things in your life, the things that will make for an incredible experience, not only then and there, but here and now. As Brent sings this song, um, I want you just to think for a moment about the truth that you've heard and, and go, what does it mean for me today to choose something better than I have been choosing? before this moment.